Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is John Amanakahara. Uh, really glad to be with you guys. I'm glad that you guys all showed up. Do a 12-step call on me. Uh, thanks for asking me uh, to do something. It's a big honor. Like, I'm different than John, who just did such an eloquent job of talking about alcoholism, where, you know, I, you know, I love to talk, whereas he doesn't, but it's the same thing. It's ego. It's just the flip side of exactly the same coin. And there's a great deal to talk about when we talk about ego. Uh, I really feel like, in my experience, that it is the, it is what starts off the alcoholism, is that, is my ego's reaction to anything that's going on in the world. So, I'm a huge fan of, of Dr. Harry Tebow, and for those of you who don't know that is, he was a, a great benefactor of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was on the original board of trustees. He, uh, When he heard about what was happening uh, in the 30s with AA, he, had, he, had a, he owned a, a rehab, and uh, they didn't have a lot of success with us back before AA. And when he heard what was happening with the spiritual... Solution, he came running to find out about it. And uh, he talks about, uh, in the 12 and 12, I think it's on page 99, someone can correct me, He talk, they talk about a group of professionals, doctors, did a study of alcoholics, and they came up with certain ideas that we have, much to the alcoholics of the times, Resentment and chagrin, uh, that we have an infantile ego and it manifests itself in, in several ways of impatient, defiant, grandiose, and thin-skinnedness. And that pretty much that every alcoholic in recovery with the guys, and he was checking on the guys with the most time at the time, which was not that much, you know, a couple of years sober, that they all had an infantile ego, that they all reacted. You see that? My ego is an instant reactor to what my eyes perceive and what my ears perceive. There's an instant reaction inside of me. Like, typically when someone, say, for instance, if I'm at a meeting and someone mentions my name from the podium, I feel in my the sides of my chest an immediate physical body reaction, and I attribute that to be my ego. Uh, the moment someone says something either for Johnny or against Johnny, there's an instant reaction inside of me. And what this, I feel it in my body, and my body's feeling sends a signal to my brain to start forming opinions about what they just said. And that now I'm in Alcoholism. This is how it works for me. So to talk about the way defiance is the outstanding characteristic of every alcoholic, and that's, I really identify with that. It's appropriate that I'm speaking on this uh, topic because, you know, I'm an extremely arrogant guy, and my air, I, at least I look like it to the outside world because the, really that arrogance is very surface level. The stuff, we could go on for a long time talking about this. So someone, uh, a very close friend in AA of mine this week accused me of having NPD, which is Narcissistic Personality Disorder, and I didn't know that much about it. Uh, but, you know, I, I, without having to Google it, I, did, I couldn't argue with them. <laughs> so I walk around like I'm puffed up, like I'm important, and there's an underlying idea that any room I walk into, I'm going to be the most important guy in the room. And this is, I know that that's insane and not real, and I never think that thought, but it's just going on below the level of my consciousness. This is grandiosity. And grandiosity 
and defiance work together. Like there's this assumption. There's these assumptions that I already have with my character that I brought to Alcoholics Anonymous when I approach a situation. I was having a conversation just before the meeting, and someone mentioned something about Cleveland and the uh, uh, first groups there and the Oxford group, and uh, I couldn't just hear what he was saying. I had to start telling him what I knew about, you know, Book Mom and the Oxford group. And this is, I'm not, I never have the thought, I'm going to show this guy how smart I am and how important I am. It's already too late. I'm not with God. It's already coming. It's already out. And he probably walks away either going, wow, that guy knows a lot about this, or wow, that guy's a jerk. Doesn't matter. I walk away going, man, look how you act. And so now that ego got me. And it sets off, that's what fires up my alcoholism because now I'm starting to self-talk about how I behaved with another person and it all was fueled by ego. So the defiance fuels who I am. Like I was sharing on uh, Tuesday night and I heard Robbie, uh, who's a member of the men's group, the Monday men's group, say it and I totally identify like, I can't listen to mainstream music because everybody listens to that and I have to defy that like whatever it is I go to the bank I need to be special all the time I need to be just a little different than you so I'm gonna now this is what's affecting a character right this is what a character is I'm starting to make every decision in my life based on the fact that I need to be a little better and a little different than you I'm creating a man without a power. I'm creating a man with me. And this has nothing to do with my drinking like this is before I ever drank. So now, by the time I get a bottle of booze in front of me, I'm already pretending to be this person that I have no idea who it is. And I wake up and I got to bolster this person and I can't meet. I can't do it. I just don't have the power to be a person who's projecting a false identity all the time. Eckhart Tolle says that that is the definition of ego, is a false perception of true self, and that one really works for me. So grandiosity is really my main, personally for me, my main problem, because this is what's talking, working with the defiance to say that I'm better than someone else or not as good as someone else. Like many people say that the function of ego is to separate. And I guess if we uh, were across the street at the Buddhist center, that's what they would suggest, because what the truth, the spiritual truth is, that we are all so one. We are all connected, that there's all oneness. And the ego's function is to say that that's not true, that I'm different and I'm better or I'm worse. And in some people, it's much more of the better side, like in my case, which leads so severely to the worse. Like I, I'm walking around acting like I'm better, and then I stop and see how that acting better makes me worse. And it's just, it's a roller coaster. It's a spinning, really painful ride. So impatience is the most obvious, persistent trait. Like, you can see it uh, in line for yourself. You Like, for me, like, at the supermarket, I'll see I come around the corner with my last item in the cart, and when I just walked past all the checkout lines, they were pretty much empty. Now they're all full and long, and, I mean, I mean, talk about restless, irritable discontent. Where am I going? I'm, it doesn't matter. I think I got somewhere important to be. The truth is, I'm obviously going home because I have my groceries. So I'm just going to unpack the groceries, but I'm always in a big hurry to do that. I can't wait for anything. And this is so deep and painful. So now these three things can team up to actually completely defeat a life because I'm too defiant to do what you do. Like the people that succeed in this world I'm not doing what they have to do. I don't have to do what they have to do because grandiosity, grandiosity is in the background telling me that I'm going to be getting all the cash and prizes and hot chicks or whatever it is that the world has to offer because I'm me and I, 
I don't have to do anything like you do. And impatience doesn't want to have to do any of the work. Like, you know, they say the grass is always greener because they water and mow it. And I'm not, I don't have time to water and mow it. It's, I just want it to be really nice right now. And all of this is teaming up to stop me from doing anything. So now I really can't go out in the world and start something small and have any kind of intestinal fortitude to watch it build and grow. So, like I said, this is so deep running, so deep rooted, so many facets, so many facets of ego. It's hard to just even define the term if we look at what Dr. Tebow uh, is talking about. It has nothing to do with where the term originally came from, which is from uh, Freud and Freudian psychology and, and the ego is the great thing. It's this balancer that sits between total selfishness and total selflessness to keep the whole human being running in middle ground. Well, I'm an alcoholic. There is no middle ground for me. It's like my life is like a go-kart, which, you know, you're never kind of pushing the gas in a go-kart. It's either pedal to the metal or all the way on the brakes, and that's really my experience. So the ego factors are extremely important. I spend a lot of time uh, in Tebow, and it's very hard to read alone. Like, I'm always going through it with other guys. Uh, I'll, I'll grab anybody. Like, anybody at meetings that wants to go through it, I say, come, let's read it, because A, I'm selfish, and B, I'm giving. Like, I want to help people. Like, this is where the joy comes, and it's obviously we'll hear all about that in step 12. So I, I, I think that encapsulates it. Uh, this is my, you know, nemesis. Tebow writes, ego is the arch enemy of sobriety. And the present moment right now, and now means now, is the arch enemy of the ego. The, e, the this, All of this stuff that reacts and goes and says things can't work if my awareness is of a power in the moment. So if I'm having a conversation with you, or I'm standing at a podium, or I'm in line at the bank, and in that moment I'm aware of the present moment and of a power, all of this bolstered prideful nonsense is turned into humility because instead of thinking I'm the power, because all of this is combining to think, to tell me that I have an assumed omnipotence, which means I'm God. That moment when I'm judging Billy and I'm judging Paul and I'm looking at you and everything is wrong, I'm a really angry, poor God and I'm doing God's job and that moment when I realize that there's a power and it's not me, the egos that put it bay for that, for that right now. And humility, which is the base principle of this entire program, is brought up and I can't, I don't react like that. I don't, I can actually listen to what you have to say instead of just waiting till you finish to talk. And these ego factors are put at bay because God is God and that's his job. And I stopped doing it. So thanks for letting me share. Thank you. Just feel free to pass them up while we're going if you have one. It says Johnny Ego on this. <laughs> <laughs> Please talk about the marvelous recuperative power of the ego. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's my favorite. So, uh, that's a great, that's a fabulous question. Whoever asked it, thank you. So when I first came to recovery uh, on day three of my sobriety, my abstinence, I realized there was something so severely wrong with me. And I tell you guys, I wasn't coming here to get sober and stay sober. I had no intention of that. I just wanted to get the heat off. And I had drank or used something probably from 12 years old to 30, almost 35 years old, there's maybe five or ten days of abstinence in all of those 23 or whatever years. 
but it took a little bit of for me three days away from the booze to re to see that there's something horribly wrong with me that I have a huge drinking problem and a huge living problem and a huge drug problem and the moment that total truth penetrated my life, my inner being, I was crushed and everything in the world completely changed. All of the sudden, I wasn't restless, irritable, discontent. All of a sudden, I was at peace for the first time in since maybe I was four or five years old. All of a sudden, I was in complete peace. And what I later learned by reading... Uh, by being with you guys and reading Tebow is that my ego was crushed and removed for that moment and I had an incredible pink cloud and my mind was open and I was able to do the steps and take the steps and go to meetings and hear absolutely for the it was the most unbelievable time of my life and what happens is that ego that got smashed invariably rebuilds itself and I often liken it to the Terminator in Terminator 2, where at the end of the movie, uh, Schwarzenegger and uh, the girl are being chased by the term by the liquid metal Terminator, and they go into the forge, and they're driving a truck with liquid nitrogen, and the liquid nitrogen hits the Terminator, and it freezes, and then they hit it, and it blows up into a million pieces, and you're like, oh, thank God, that's over. But then the heat of the forge melts it back, and the the Terminator just comes back and rebuilds exactly like it was, and that's the same way the ego does. That's why I got to keep coming. That's why I got to keep hearing a message. That's This ego is going to completely rebuild, and the real treatment is 12 steps, like especially at 6, 7, 8, and 9. This is where I can actually see and feel reduction of this ridiculous childish ego that I have. How do you control your ego? Uh, I don't. I, I, I don't. Uh, I was at, uh, I spoke at uh, the Thursday meeting a couple of months ago, and we got a fellowship at a restaurant on Santa Monica Boulevard, and this uh, young lady was there, and I said to her, what did you think of the meeting? And she said, that speaker was horrible. <laughs> and I don't know if she was trying to poke fun. She was new. I think she was just completely unaware, but it doesn't matter. In that moment, I was able to, I was able to say thank, thank you, God, for protecting me from my ego because I had not one ill feeling for this girl. It was so beautiful, and we sat down, and as we're having dinner, I took a look at her, and I go, you know what? I just hate her. Like total awareness in the moment of God and gra gratitude. I have no power over this thing. I, I need. This is where the third dimensional mind breaks down. It doesn't work. I need to have a new method of living and building a new character one day at a time, one minute at a time, one second at a time, because I have no ability to control any of that. that. My inner life is not my job. That is my higher power's job. And my only problem is that I, I want to take that job and refuse to let him do it. The more I can let a power in to do that, the more a real character, a beautiful, loving, listener, peaceful character is built and the ego gets reduced. You want to find out what ego reduction is? Go make amends to someone who wronged you more than you wronged them. And you can feel your ego just breaking down. Like It's the difference between that initial crushing and a slow, methodical, 12-step dismantling of building a new character. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, I think you just did that one, didn't you? Yes. Can ego man itself manifest itself as a spiritual awakening or spiritual fitness? Can ego manifest itself as a spiritual awakening or spiritual fitness? Yeah, uh, Astrid's sponsor came and spoke at the Saturday night meeting, and he uh, he said it real well that his sponsor told him that there's going to be a kind of time in his life when his biggest problem is spiritual pride, 
and this is a trap uh, for me and for uh, for all of us. Like that's why I can't possibly control it because the so now I start to t- really rather than do the steps like some kind of homework for my sponsor, I start to take the steps into my life and the joy of living starts to happen and I take credit for it and I say, wow, I've done this, I'm now a spiritual guy. And then someone says something to me and I am coming at them with the answer to their problem and they did not ask me for my advice. Now, I think, um, again, It's a false sense of true self. I think I'm bigger than I am because I've been given a gift. And that's what grace is, an undeserved gift. So now I'm living in grace, taking credit for it, and it's over. And I spiritual pride is not fun and not pretty and uh, hurts me if I'm the one that's conveying it way more than it hurts anybody in the blast radius of, uh, of my alcoholism. If the ego is not my amigo, what becomes that healthy balancer? Our higher power? Well, I'll, I'll let you deal with the rest of that. Yeah. Uh, not my amigo. The ego is not my amigo. And ego is the amigo of alcoholism. Like that's like those two. Ted used to say they're... Uh, First, he said they're Siamese twins, and then Siamese twins became, uh, thank you, NPC, not politically correct, so we call them conjoined twins. And those two, and you'll hear about self in a minute, combine to create, to bolster this ideal of self uh, and lead to self-obsession. And that's where... Dry, pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization comes from me. So, I'm not answering the question, however. (laughs) Again, as I said, when we define ego around here, we're not talking about what lives between the id and the superego. We're talking about an infantile ego, like a little baby. Like when I go to the bank and there's a big line, There's some part of me that believes they're all on line against me. Like that there was a conspiracy to turn that light red because I'm in a hurry. It doesn't talk to me like that, but this is the inner experience, this frustration that happens. If you think about what a parent who's pushing a shopping cart and they have a small child and they walk down the toy aisle and the kid is able to grab a squirt gun and say, mine, because that's me, right? Mine, like mine. The parent says, oh, honey, I love you, but you can't have that. Like, the reaction from the two-year-old is me. Like, that's how I'm reacting. This is an infantile reaction. It's not socially acceptable for me to just start laying down on the ground and pounding and kicking and screaming and crying which is kind of what I'd like to do. Like, I'm sure the store manager would probably give me anything I wanted to, to stop me because I'm scaring the other customers at Ralph's. So there is no healthy balance. Like, there's no compromise with the ego. Like, this, thing, this is the constant uh, vigilance that, that John was talking about. I have to be constantly willing to... Or as much as my higher power makes me aware of my ego, and as much as my higher power makes me aware of my alcoholism, and as much as I get get the grace to be aware of self-obsession, I have to be willing to do something about it, to drop on my knees and say, look, I'm trying to do your job, and I, I, I suck at it. Can you please show me who you want me to be and show me what my job is because I'm terrible at doing yours. And there's no, there is no balance for me as an alcoholic. And personally, you may find it, but that hasn't been my experience yet. But it's new. I'm on the sober 10 years. Is that it? Two more. Okay. 
What kind of character would I be without my ego? This is a two-parter. A, what kind of character would I be without my ego? B, why does it seem to me that creativity is linked for better or worse to ego? Okay. A, what kind of character would I be without my ego? I like that character. Uh, and B, to me that creativity is linked for better or worse. Uh, the first part is uh, my experience, like my brief experience with having my ego smashed. I'm going to tie these into one. I was so open and so free and so able to see the world in an incredibly beautiful and green and loving way, like when my ego was completely smashed down, that that's when my mind is open, because ego is going to close, is going to compare and judge everything, and that's closing me down. I don't know about you. I know about me. When the ego is shut off, my mind opens up, and by definition, an open area has room to create. Like the unmanifested, new ideas, beautiful things can occur in a mind that is open. And ego is the enemy of the open mind. It's a so, it's not my job, again, to be without ego. That's my higher power's job. And... If I do his work well and he does this for me, the creativity that I have in my life is absolutely incredible. Last one. Oh, good. How do you listen? What do you say? Not very well. Uh, no, it's really interesting, like, I really learned to listen for the first time when I was first getting sober, like because of that experience that I had. I was in a, a, a Jewish rehab and I didn't know anything about Judaism other than it was neurotic and painful <laughs> before I, I uh, went into this place. And every morning we'd get up at 6 a.m. and, and uh, study Torah. And I had no idea what the, I had heard that word, so I didn't know anything. And the teachers would have us study it and read it and then talk about how it affects our life today or really in the immediate past. And this was a new thing for me. So this is where the ego benefited me because I wanted to be heard by all the other important alcoholics in the rehab I was in. So I would try to say something interesting. And by trying to say something interesting, I had to really listen to the reading and really think about what was being said. And then I would go to meetings and listen to the speaker. I don't know how it happened. I could start to hear something. And as the ego rebuilt, I could no longer hear anything because I know, I know what he's talking about. It's just a drunk log anyway. And of course the nuggets that were said in that, I couldn't hear them. So the only way I can listen is by practicing the presence of God in the moment. When the speaker starts talking, when the meeting, when chapter 5 is read, I can stop and say, God, can you help me hear chapter 5? Can you help me hear? Because this may not be for me, but it may be for someone I can help later. Maybe I can hear something that's for me. Maybe I can hear. I just don't know. Can you show me how to listen? Because this is my life and it's important to me. So, thanks for letting me speak. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.